morning, everyone. I'm just going to adjust that to that camera. We've got some darkness there. Not sure what that is. Here we go. How's that? It might look a little bit better. Ah, much better. Uh, really great to be with you this morning. My name's Ross Callahan, pastor of Granville Community Baptist Church, and we're commencing our um, Christmas uh, uh, sermon series <clears throat> titled uh, The Songs of Christmas. And the first sermon that we're going to look at is in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 to 7, and it's titled Christmas Bells. Um, in his brief commentary, Kirk Patson mentions a doctor by the name of Oliver Sacks, a neurologist who explores the question of how the human brain affects the way we are. In his latest book, Music, Musicophilia, he writes about his own experience of his mother's death and the place music played in the process of grief. Uh, for weeks, he said, I would get up, dress, drive to work, see my patients and try to present normal. Um, but inside I was dead. Lifeless as a zombie. Then one day I was walking down Bronx Park East and felt a sudden lightning, a quickening of mood, a sudden intimation of life and of joy. Only then did I realise that I was hearing music ever so faintly. Sachs walked until he found the source of music pouring out Schubert from a basement window. The music pierced me, he said, releasing a cascade of memories of childhood summer holidays and my mother's own affection for Schubert. I found myself not only smiling for the first time in weeks, but laughing aloud and alive once again. Uh, Kirk Patson says one of the things that he loves about this story is it's all about transformation. It's about moving from death to life. And Isaiah's movement in our passage today is all about moving from death to life. Isaiah offers his hearers a profound change of direction from judgment to salvation and peace. And as Patson uh, quotes, and in the book of Isaiah, God's last word is salvation and peace rather than judgment. A transformation from darkness to light and from death to life. And in many ways, that's the common theme in Christmas movies where there is some sort of encounter with someone who's so full of the Christmas spirit that they are transformed and, and or those who meet that person are transformed by this encounter. Even the most cynical soul is converted and transformed into the most wonderful person. And many Christmas stories, of course, want to promote that childhood innocence and belief. And in some way, they all have a kind of transformative element about it that would go to making you and I and our world a better place. Less anger, more peace, less hatred, more love. Not such a bad thing. Less greed and a little bit more generosity, a bit more compassion and a bit more joy and a bit less prejudice and a lot more acceptance wouldn't be such a bad thing for you and I this Christmas or for our world for that matter. Uh, I know you're familiar with the story, the storylines these Christmas movies and stories have, Elf, uh, Arthur's Christmas, Santa Claus and Polar Express, uh, all have at the heart the notion that you and me will be touched by the Christmas story and enjoy the Christmas event with a sweet change of heart. I think that's about right. It sums it up, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, that's the story or the Christmas story we get given each year. And like I said, the takeaway is that uh, we'd be a little bit better and the world would be a much better place to live in. 
But that's not what we really need, a little bit of a, 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 you know, a temporary transformation, a little bit of a change of mood or heart. or anything. No. We need something much deeper than that, much more changing, you know, life-changing. We need presence because that's what Christmas is really all about, isn't it? I'm joking, of course. I mean, three pairs of socks and a, and a, a book to read in January is hardly life-changing, is it? You know, we don't need presents, even if we like to get them, and nothing wrong with that, of course. But what we really need under the Christmas tree, well, for those on Fraser Island, would be maybe 50 mils of rain. Or for the corona vaccines to be accessible to everyone and to work, especially if you're in those countries that are continuing to uh, rise in coronavirus cases. Now, you know, having said that, what we really need is something that addresses our deepest needs, which means that we, in fact, need a new story, something different, a story that is going to be truly transformative, a story that isn't going to be left on the bookshelf at the end of January. What we need is a story that brings lasting change to our lives. I mean, because consider Ebenezer Scrooge. We don't know if he, you know, after that great uh, uh, epiphany that one night, doesn't go back into the counting room and begin to uh, count up all the excess of Christmas. Or if George Bailey in the uh, a Wonderful Life didn't fall back into depression after, uh, you know, that great night. Or if the Grinch lived happily ever after yeah, with the Who's down in Who'sville. You know, it's no surprise, is it, that if we want something that's going to offer transformation, then we'll need a story that offers true transformation. And you obviously guessed it. It's the story of Jesus' birth. This story is fundamentally different because it promises something different and it addresses totally different problems. Um, as you'll see in the newsletter coming shortly, I've uh, included the amazing carol from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow titled, titled sorry, Christmas Bells. He wrote it in 1863 on the back of his son returning from uh, the Civil War fighting um, in the Union Army and, of course, he came home injured. Longfellow had already uh, lost his first wife in childbirth and his second wife uh, died after being severely burnt in the home. So, you know, he's been through a lot and he's had a tough life. But he writes this carol in the context of that grief and fear of the future, which many, I think, can relate to today after all that 2020 has brought us. And in this context, he writes, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. And pretty much as it begins the carol, he says this, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Now, whatever the story or movie that you watch at Christmas time, it's always got a real sense, a strong sense of hope and, and, and a real sort of pitch that the world would find peace at Christmas time. And there would, of course, be goodwill to all men. That those who are uh, disenfranchised, who are on the margins of society, would be treated kindly and be blessed and given things generously. And, and that's what the opening line talks about. But, you know, the thing that's unusual about this carol is found in verse 3 when we discover the poet's realness, his, his um, I guess, 
you know, down-to-earth view of the world. Let's read verse 3. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Yeah, the poets looked around and he's, he's seen that there's no peace on earth and, and there's not much goodwill being shared to those on the margins of society. There's no sugary niceness in this line of how fantastic Christmas time is and how magically it transforms every person into, you know, just a generous, kind, loving soul. No, it's a very honest evaluation of humanity and the world we live in today. Well, that's pretty grim, Ross. It's Christmas time. Please give us a bit of joy. Well, hang on. But I want to just point out that we can really relate to that, can't we? You don't have to be a poet who's experienced, you know, their son being injured or their daughter or their wives or husbands being taken away too early. Oh, no, that's a pretty common thing for many people. You know, we've just marked the anniversary of the White Island tragedy. Saw it on TV the other night. Devastating. We've just marked the anniversary, of course, of the senseless uh, right-wing shooting of over 50 uh, Muslim people peacefully in mosques in New Zealand. You know, we're, we're not unaware of these, um, these atrocities, of the reality of our world. I mean, 2020 has exposed some deep-seated racism and violence, isn't it, as we looked across America this year. And we've seen our own people rip and tear for a couple of toilet rolls. Do you remember that? Greed and hoarding on an unprecedented level, and not to mention those governments with their power games and armies and our own soldiers committing war crimes. The negligence of world leaders as the corona virus got out of control in certain countries. And then personally, as we look at our own lives and families, we recognise that we, in some small way, too, have been affected by all this. And the words of this verse become our stark reality. And it creates at Christmas a real tension, a real tension point, because we believe in the hope that Christmas offers and we deeply want peace on earth and goodwill to all men. But I think there's a few ways that we deal with it. We either say it's too hard, we throw our hands up and say, I can't do anything about it and throw a couple of dollars towards a charity or whatever like that. Or like Longfellow does and despairs at the truth that our world and our lives lack peace and goodwill. But the most popular response is to just ignore it, to try and have a nice little Christmas, our own little Christmas in a bubble. And just try and get through the other side of it. You know, I was watching a show the other night titled 12 Stories of Christmas. And one of the stories was a woman who was a child uh, who lived in Darwin in that fateful night when Tracy, the cyclone Tracy, ripped through the town. She was from a Polish background and so was celebrating Christmas on Christmas Eve. She spoke about never liking Christmas since and just wanted it to pass. And her response, of course, naturally was born out of fear and that memory of, of such such a tragic event, a life-changing event. They talk of Darwin before and after, Tracy. And that's our response in many ways, our fear of the future that we're going to have less and not enough. And so we greedily hold on to what we've got. 
But you know, there's another story that speaks into this scenario, and it's found in the passage in Isaiah chapter 9. It's all about the birth of Jesus. Now, Isaiah isn't speaking directly into uh, the context of this, uh, the people's situation. He's speaking prophetically 700 years in advance. Amazing. And before you say, hey, I've got not another story from a long uh, and far and distant time that means nothing to us today, listen, because I, I think it's got a lot that relates to us. And see if it doesn't sound familiar. Israel, in the context, had just come through an unprecedented, there's that word again, time of prosperity with growth in every area. Trade was good. It was a time of peace from neighbouring countries and it was just on the up and up. Everybody was, you know, living well. But it looked like it was going to crash. Threatened by powerful enemies who were advancing their campaign for dominance, Judah itself, Isaiah says, is walking in darkness. And with Isaiah showing a downward spiral as they chase, or Judah chases after occult practices and as they turn away from God, there's a dreadful sense of God handing them over to their choices, even if their consequences are dire. Israel will look upon their ruined city as an opportunity to rebuild, to make something better out of it, but it's not renovations that they should be looking to. That shouldn't be on their mind. It should be repentance. And there's a real threat that their king would be the last king in the line of David. And the city of Jerusalem would fall and exile would be imminent. It's a desperate situation, but Isaiah throughout the book tells us that the Lord is desperate for his people too. And it's into this context that Isaiah speaks words of hope. You know, you might be familiar with those developments in the book of Isaiah in the first 12 chapters, but you'd probably be familiar with these words out of verse 6. For to us a child is born... To us, a son is given. You see, it describes a bringing in of peace and where a prince would be established by God himself. And when this massive reversal happens, Isaiah paints the picture that it's going to be like the rising of the sun in the morning. Light means that God's word and his truth are finally here and they bring the dawning of a new day. Let me read verse 2 to you. The people walk in darkness, walking in darkness, sorry, have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. The passage, uh, as the passage develops, the image of light emerges you know, brightly and we see it's described to, it's used to describe a person who is tri triumphant. A royal figure, in fact. And Isaiah, of course, likens this great victory that he's going to bring as um, a victory of, over an old enemy, as was Gideon's victory. Verse 3 and 4, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoiced at the harvest as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. You see, Midian's defeat was when Gideon led a small army who blew trumpets and shouted and, to their amazement, watched the Midian army turn on themselves with their swords. And as I was saying, another day is coming like that, where a surprise victory will bring great fortune and joy for all. He describes a glorious transformation. And the first century Christians saw the birth of Jesus as the fulfilment of this royal figure in Isaiah 9. Who is the light of the world and the child who is given these marvellous and extraordinary names. Listen to verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is giving, given. 
And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These names are so magnificent and their titles so royal that they are definitely too great for a human and validate the truth that Jesus is truly human and truly divine, as John 1.14 tells us. And we're going to look at that as we share the Lord's Supper in just a little while. And this child that Isaiah speaks of will be the one who establishes an everlasting kingdom, not because of some political alliance or humans or human power or anything like that, no, because it's a kingdom established by God where the Prince of Peace will reign and there will finally be peace on earth and goodwill to me. It's not set up by military might or political power, but it's set up in the hearts and minds of men and women, daughters and sons all over the world. And these are the ones that have been transformed in their hearts and their lives are changed from this story of Jesus' birth. This is the hope of Christmas, friends, and it invites us into a different position in life. Instead of being frozen in fear of not having enough for the future or shrinking into our own little bubble, pretending that you know, things aren't like they are, No, it offers us a position where we can be generous. With the hope of this child born as the Christ, we have the confidence and assurance that we have a future hope, that we have more and not less. The future promises more and leads us into a totally different experience so we can be generous because we know our hope is based on better things. Dear friends, hear me. If you allow this hope to fill your hearts, you too will be transformed. And friends, isn't that what the Christmas story is really all about anyway? This child's story, bringing hope to a world, real transformation, and this story, of course, will be fleshed out by the New Testament writers who describe exactly who this child is and how he establishes his kingdom on earth. I want to close by drawing one aspect of Jesus' kingdom and I want to re read the last verse of our carol titled Christmas Bells. Then peeled the bells more loud and deep God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, good will to men. Did you hear that? God is not dead. The birth of Jesus is in a warm, fuzzy baby story with a cute little baby in a snug little cradle. No, Jesus' birth means that justice will prevail and wrongs will fail. His upside-down kingdom will bring that about. God is not dead, nor is he unaware of our plight, and he's not asleep, that he doesn't notice. The promise of peace is given, and it invites us into the hope that fills our life. And therefore, we can ring the bells of freedom and truth. Ring the bells this Christmas of deliverance from sin and fear. Ring the bells of abundance of God's kingdom. Ring the bells of rich mercy in Jesus Christ. Ring the bells of the good news of the gospel that offers forgiveness and restoration to all men, bringing mankind back to himself, filling them with hope, that this king truly reigns. Ring the bells of salvation and hear the good news this morning. The good news of the Saviour called Jesus, 
wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Ring the bells this Christmas of Christ's birth, of his redemption for you and I. Ring the bells, are you listening this morning? Because salvation has come in Christ, that child who will reign in the hearts and lives of men and women. Ring the bells, will you come? Will you be transformed by the story of Christ, the child, the newborn king? Ring the bells and come to him this Christmas. Ring the bells, it's Christmas. A new hope offered to all who will receive. No greater gift shall you find. It's not presents we need, no. It's the gift of salvation, the gift of hope and the forgiveness of sin. A redemption that fills our hearts with the spirit of God that will cause us to enter into that experience of generosity, of assurance of better things, of a life beyond this planet. <coughs> Ring the bells this Christmas. God's not dead. He's alive forevermore. And he offers you eternal life this Christmas. I want to wish you and pray that you and your family have a safe and blessed Christmas. My prayer is that you will find this peace that is only found in that story of Jesus, the child who has come to rule and reign, to upturn the injustices of this world and offer us a future, a future world with him for eternity. I really hope you've <clears throat> heard that this morning and heard the bells of Christmas, the gospel offering you new life. We're going to continue our service now and we're going to take communion together and I'm going to read from John's gospel as we just touched on earlier. John 1.14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. We have a God who has not just sat or sat in his little bubble and stayed in heaven or ignored us or was asleep. Our God is alive and he sent his son in flesh as that babe, as that child we read about. Child is born. The son is given to us. As we share our, our uh, emblems this morning, I want you to just ponder for a second on the great gift that God has given to all mankind, Jesus, the one who has come in the flesh, the one we have seen, and the one who offers grace and truth to all who believe in him. And, of course, went to the cross. On the night before he was betrayed, Jesus broke bread, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks and praise that you sent Jesus. That his body was broken for us, that we might have redemption, that we might be brought back to you. That he fulfilled this promise in Isaiah, the fulfilment of a saviour being born.
In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this uh, is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's drink. Heavenly Father, we want to praise you, thank you for Jesus, for his sacrifice, for his blood being shed, cleansing, cleansing us from all sin, making that atonement, that sacrifice for us. The price he paid for our sin was his life and his blood on the altar, that you would receive that perfect offering that you might bring us back, that we might have a way to come to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Well, that uh, concludes our service this morning. We're uh, encouraged that uh, we'll be meeting again soon. Please stay tuned and uh, uh, look on your emails for our, our, our newsletter. God bless. Have a safe and... Uh, joyous week and uh, look forward to seeing you soon.